I want to welcome you all to Autonomy for a Sustainable Future. I will be leading you through this event. My name is Astrid Rusos Christoffersen and I work for Kongsberg Maritime. We are so excited to have you joining this event and we look forward to an interesting discussion. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function throughout the presentation. We will introduce you to the theme of autonomy in two of our market segments where Kongsberg Maritime is present. This is autonomy for oil and gas producing assets as well as for shipping. We will hear what is meant by autonomy in these segments. Autonomy is often interpreted as a function with no human interaction. However, we define autonomy in different levels, as you soon will learn. We have an exciting agenda for this event. We will have two presentations around what is autonomy? What do we mean by autonomy for shipping? And what do we mean by autonomy for oil and gas producing assets? So why do we discuss these two areas of autonomy of our session? Kongsberg Maritime is a technology provider of control systems and safety systems. What is this control system platform providing? We will hear from Jason presenting Kongsberg Control System, our technology platform for providing autonomy. If you're a technology geek, this is your time to focus during this presentation. If you are not into all the technical details, don't freak out and don't leave us because the next two presentations are made for you that just want to make your life less stressful and don't like to be stuck in traffic. Jason, he will talk about that and talk about his dreams and take you through the authorship program that has a vision of uh, reaching autonomy in just a couple of years. In the end of the presentation, we have said some goodies to keep you all engaged throughout the whole presentation. We will hear from Antun van Quali. He has founded Sulu Associates that aims to have autonomous vessel operational in two to three years for short sea shipping and inland waterways. He will present their logistics and autonomy vision. I would like to present you to you all the fantastic people that you will meet today. Anne Margrethe Riste, she works for Kongsberg Maritime, director of Next Generation Shipping, and will present autonomy in shipping. Kåre Finnbach and Gaute Bakli, they work for Kongsberg Maritime. They will present autonomy for oil and gas producing units. Jason McFarlane, Kongsberg Maritime, Manager of Research, Innovation, IP Technology Management. He will present Kongsberg Control System and our authorship program. Antun van Quali, he's an entrepreneur who started an inland shipping company, Blue Line Logistics, in 2011 with novel inland barges. Antun has now founded Sulu Associates, and Kongsa Maritime is proud to work with Zulu. But now, let's start the show and you will meet Amagrit Rista. Thank you, Astrid, for that great introduction. And hello to everyone online. I am Anne Magritte Riste, Director of Next Generation Shipping in Kongsberg Maritime. And I have the pleasure of starting the session with my favorite topic, autonomy in shipping hopefully managing to bring some clarity and insight to the subject of autonomous vessels. I am a naval architect from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim, Norway, and I have worked in Kongsberg for 11 years with automation systems for new build vessels, as project manager for research and development projects, and the last four years within the field of autonomy. But first of all, I'd like to start with two key points I want you to remember from my session. Number one, autonomous does not equal unmanned. Think about that for a second. And point number two, we are not about to start on a new journey for maritime. We as an industry are very much on it already. But first, let us set the context. The maritime industry has seen great technological shifts over the years 
and is once again in the middle of a profound change. Even before the COVID-19 hit us like a ton of bricks earlier this year, the maritime industry was in the era of digitalization, focusing on data, connectivity, and optimization. We are experiencing a shift from standalone products to integrated systems and beyond, to consumer-oriented on-demand services. The goals are safer, more efficient, and more sustainable maritime operations, where data and connectivity are key enablers. The market has, up till now, been slow at adopting and fully benefiting from new digital innovations. Key challenges I could mention are a lack of return on investments and standalone solutions, poor data quality and lack of standards, cybersecure issues, we all know about that, and general market maturity. As you see in the dark blue bubble, connecting the vessel and assets securing value is the first step on the journey. This is where the majority of the focus is right now. We have seen an increased momentum and focus in 2020, fueled by the sudden need for remote solutions in many aspects of our lives. And we expect this momentum to grow even more rapidly within 21. Today, we estimate that approximately 2,000 vessels in the world fleet are connected. With new builds and refits, we expect this to triple in the next one to two years and expand exponentially after that, as satellite coverage and alternative ship-to-shore communication channels becomes available and affordable. This phase is driven mainly by the pursuit of op OPEX reduction, energy fuel saving, smarter maintenance, smoother logistics, and automatic reporting to reduce the workload. The next step you see here will focus on integration of ERP systems and logistical solutions, route planning based on online fuel and cargo price on demand, availability and priorities in ports and terminals is more efficient due to sharing of relevant information. Looking towards autonomous vessels, we expect more and more of the vessel operation, the maneuvering, loading, unloading, trim, etc., to be remotely operated or autonomous. The crew experience and know-how is still highly valued and needed both on vessel and onshore control centers. The end stage for Maritime 4.0 anticipates fully integrated end-to-end -end logistic solutions where all parts of the value chain are seamlessly sharing information and achieving the most energy efficient transport of products. And while we are on the topic of, of autonomous vessels, for the purpose of this presentation, I will use the definition for levels of autonomy set forth by the Norwegian Forum for Autonomous Ships and Sintef Ocean. The definition divides the levels of autonomy into five steps from decision support to fully autonomous. This brings us back to key point number one. We may describe autonomous as the extent to which a system can carry out its own processes and operations without external control meaning that it's not a question of all or nothing. In Kongsberg, we are currently working on solutions with our partners targeting level two through four, meaning systems for operator support at level two, for remote operation and surveillance, as well as for unmanned operation at level four. When developing anything, you want to understand the boundaries and to clearly define the system of interest. We group our development into what we have termed the three pillars of autonomous operations. The vessel capabilities and not just the navigational functionality. The bi-directional secure connectivity. The remote operation center. So when we talk about autonomous operation, the system of interest includes all three pillars. And with our background as Kongsberg Maritime, we started with what we know best the existing vessel systems and sensors for understanding a vessel surrounding. We have grouped the vessel functionality into operate equipment, maneuver vessel, navigate vessel, manage mission, sense and analyze environment, and sense and analyze equipment, as you can see on the bottom here. So let us take a quick look into what is happening in this area at the moment. There is a lot of development related to object detection, classification, and collision avoidance going on right now, with the end goal of enabling an operator to safely operate one or more vessels from a remote operation center. 
This work requires massive amounts of data to train the neural networks, applying machine learning to the algorithms, verifying and double checking the results against reality. Another key factor is the use of simulators to test out behavior, try out scenarios too dangerous for live testing, and replicating the integration of systems. We are developing on the basis of our existing knowledge in Kongsberg and well-proven solutions. We see this as an evolution, not a revolution. Now I've talked about ongoing development, but before I close off, I would like to share an example of development which has transgressed into a commercially available solution. One year ago, we were competing with Rolls-Royce Commercial Marine on highly automated functionality for maneuvering and positioning. Rolls-Royce had a head start on automatic crossing, while in Kongsberg, we were in lead on automatic berthing. Luckily for us, we have been able to combine our efforts and have been granted approval by the Norwegian Maritime Authority for using in commercial service, auto berthing and auto crossing functionality on a 143 meter long double ended road ferry owned by Bostefusen, operating between the cities of Horten and Moss on either side of the busy Oslo Fjord in Norway. The crossing takes approximately 30 minutes and the vessel operates at an average speed of 12.5 knots. The captain selects the preferred route according to wind and weather conditions, pushes activate and the system does rest from unberthing, crossing automatically and berths safely on the other side. For the second quarter this year, the chief operation officer reported that the automatic system had been used in 89% of the voyages and that the fuel consumption is steadily decreasing as the algorithms are trained from experience. For Bustifusen, the focus is on safety and consistency according to their scheduled service. The automatic system enables optimized use of engine power and speed in the crossing phase as the auto berthing system gives you the confidence to be at the key on time every time. Although you might argue this is not in the range of unmanned autonomy, these capabilities are essential building blocks to enable autonomous operation. We are building up experience and confidence in our systems with the operator and also with the flag state. This is a prime example of what is achievable when you have good partners working together. And moving on to the connectivity solution, we are developing and testing solutions for vessel to vessel communication, vessel to shore and land based infrastructure. We are looking at both non real time and real time critical systems with strict latency requirements. And of course, you can imagine cybersecurity is high on the agenda. And for the third pillar, we focus on fleet management, remote control, autonomous operation, ship management, and mission planning. In Kongsberg, we are technical experts, but we still have a way to go on the operational side. That's why we wanted to team up with someone who are experts in this field. And Wilhelmsen are the perfect fit for this particular challenge. Together with Wilhelmsen, we established the company called Mastly. And with Mastly working to take position as the operator of autonomous vessels, here we have a strong partners bringing solid expertise and competence to the collaborative effort of transitioning autonomous vessels from concepts into full scale sustainable solutions with commercial contracts. Autonomy is not new. It is a natural evolution made possible by technology and by the motivational incentives becoming strong enough. When we talk about autonomy and shipping, it is not just about the vessel. It's about the entire logistical chain. It's about system integration and connecting and inter interacting with a wide range of systems and suppliers. And the next big question is on standardization and open source code but that is a topic worthy of its own presentation for next time. Thank you for your attention. And now over to Kåre Finnbach and Gaute Bakli, who will share their expertise within autonomy in oil and gas producing assets. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. This is um, Kåre speaking. There are two of us who will take you through the story of what we're doing with regards to autonomy in oil and gas. It's uh, Goethe, 
Buckley. You see him to the left. He's the guy with the dark hair. Seven years in uh, Kungsberg Maritime. He has his background in cybernetics, as many of uh, our colleagues in uh, the company has. I've got eight years in uh, the Kungsberg Group. My background is in fact in petroleum geology and system development. And I've been working for several operators and IT companies over the years. Amongst others, spent a lot of time on integrated operations, as many of you may be familiar with. Well, let's uh, turn to the uh, topic. And uh, what I'll start with is a picture of uh, the ones five group field. The field is um, in production, as uh, you all know. The second phase of the development will be done next year. And uh, it's a big processing facility we're looking at. There are similarities, of course, between the maritime industry and oil and gas. But uh, the fact that we are looking at the big processing facility or production unit, as we call it, is the main difference. This is what we are looking at when we are talking about uh, increased automation and autonomy. The uh, field consists, when uh, completed, of uh, two processing uh, platforms, a riser platform, a drilling platform, and a living quarter. It's one of the biggest projects currently undergoing in Norway, one of the biggest industrial projects ever. As you see here, engaging around 150,000 man-years throughout the development phase. When in production, the field will produce 600,000 barrels of oil per day. And uh, it will get all the electricity needed from shore. This makes it also a breakthrough project in many ways, reducing emissions uh, significantly. Kongsberg uh, Maritime has been part of this project and is still through the delivery of the Kongsberg control system. So a control system delivered by Kongsberg then is used to control the process from wells through the processing facilities you see to the export line. Looking at um, our position with regards to production units, we are present uh, in many places uh, uh, globally. And uh, we have uh, delivered control systems to uh, floaters, to fixed platforms, as well as subsea facilities. This gives us a very good viewpoint to observe and also try to understand what is happening in the oil and gas industry. What are the operators doing? What is the industry doing to adapt to new challenges, uh, new price levels, for instance? So, what are we seeing? Well, it's like in the maritime industry, it's new operational concepts that are emerging. The industry has been through quite a uh, evolution over the last 20 years, from fully manned facilities that were operated as self-sustainable fields, to uh, integrated operations with remote support centers and more work done uh, onshore. People and activities moved from the platforms to the shore. Now we are seeing a new kind of development taking place, new operational concept being established that leans heavily on automation and also more and more autonomy. And I think uh, Many of us are familiar with this, also of um, uh, you uh, listeners. Uh, many fields here in Norway, now green fields for instance, are considered developed as unmanned facilities and managed remotely. And that will require more autonomy. So that's kind of the uh, development we are looking at. The benefits associated with this are significant. This is uh, an estimate made by Rysta Energy last year, where they looked at the effect of costs on the development of these new operational concepts. And as you see here, it's quite big. It represents roughly a 10% reduction of the cost base. And it affects, as you see here, both the facility capex and the operational opex as such. Meaning that to realize this, we need to take a hard look at both the way facilities are developed 
in addition to operate it. So looking at um, the key drivers then, increased efficiency is a key driver. And to uh, really realize the benefits here, we need to simplify the assets or the facilities. It's key. That's why unmanned facilities are so interested or interesting. But also low man facilities. Then also standardization, systems, equipment. In addition, we have sustainability as a key driver. The industry is faced with requirements to lower emissions. And we see also quite a lot of development in that area. Hybrid networks being established, wind onshore power being used in addition to the traditional gas turbines. Underpinning this, we have the power really of digitalization that makes it possible to access information and also the solutions you need to uh, take decisions based on the information from anywhere. And this also facilitates automation and autonomy, basically closing the loop. That is key for remote operations to succeed as a first step, but eventually also full autonomy. There are several steps towards autonomy and Anna Grit has been through this. Our evaluation of the current situation is that most fields today, they are at level two. The um, automation systems and uh, the software used is in control of uh, routine logic but the humans make the decisions and take the actions, basically. What we see is that the operators and the vendors like us now also are working quite focused on automation and autonomous or autonomy regarding selective processes. So we see that development on several fields, brown fields, and also, of course, affecting the green fields. So looking at some of the greenfields development that currently are being evaluated, unmanned concepts that rely heavily on automation and also more and more autonomy are being evaluated. It's just to look in the newspapers to see which fields uh, we are talking about here. So in many ways, the journey has started towards autonomy for selected processes first, but also for full autonomy. <clears throat> What uh, is needed? Four pillars we are talking about. First of all, looking at uh, the assets themselves, the facilities, they need to be robustified and well tested. That goes for both green fields and brown fields. And in that context, we are focusing on what we call simulation driven design and engineering. Do as Al Magrit was talking about concerning the ships and the operations, simulate and test the behavior before we put anything into operation. Also, cloud and edge platforms, as we call it here, need it to give people remotely access to information and applications, but also to um, operate the facilities remotely, or not remotely, uh, to operate the facilities autonomously. If, for instance, uh, the communication networks uh, breaks, we have also the remote centers that are needed to supervise and also intervene when needed. And underlying everything here, cybersecurity. Technologies, processes needed to secure remote connection, secure data exchange, and also segregate networks and uh, duties. And in a manner that unifies the approach across fields and companies. So what does uh, Kongsberg have to offer in this context? Basically, we can offer the industry what is needed to support all of these pillars. So this slide is a bit busy, but uh, at the very left, you see our automation and control system, Kongsberg control system, as we call it, KCS. This has um, been uh, developed to control the asset itself, but also to be used as a system to provide information and applications on the shore. We also have our own cloud solution that can be connected to any platform, digital platform, 
and be used to deploy applications as well, uh, both uh, on the asset and um, remotely to the operation centers. In the set of applications we are offering, we are covering most of the areas that are of interest to the industry, we believe. Operations, of course, production optimization, condition monitoring, energy management, that's examples. But we also have as part of this our own simulators, process and flow simulators, case bias and ledger flow, for instance. So it's a um, powerful ecosystem we have established and are developing to facilitate automation and autonomy. A few words about the per control system, KCS, is needed. Just a few keywords. It's a multi-layered control system. It's based on open standards, and it facilitates, as I mentioned, deployment of applications on-site as well as remotely. And it can be deployed on top of any automation system that exists out there. That is important for the operators to standardize processes and uh, their toolkits across assets. Jason will uh, talk about uh, this a bit in more detail later. In the end here, let us share some uh, concrete examples of uh, what we are doing in close cooperation with uh, operators. Uh, these examples, Goethe will take us through. So uh, please, Goethe. Thank you, uh, Gloria. Um, so as we heard today, uh, uh, in KM, we believe that efficiency and the high level of autonomy is uh, the way into a greener and more sustainable future. And we see that our customers are moving in this direction too. We are currently taking on several studies and development projects to further explore and push the en envelope of what's possible. And we are definitely ready for some big leaps in the near future. Uh, here are just a few examples of what we currently are working on. Um, we are looking into autonomous uh, unmanned facilities, of course. Uh, one button startup. Uh, we are ex experimenting with running through different uh, sequences uh, of startup and shutdown automatically. Um, automated configuration of our safety and automation system to increase efficiency and reduce cost and time. Um, we are looking into new ways of implementing project deliveries, uh, automatic choking of wells, and automatic MEG ejection. I'd like to highlight a couple of these, so please go to the next slide. <clears throat> so let's start with the simulator-driven project implementation. So in this example, um, I'd like to say a few words about how tools in which we are developing autonomous application also can be used to streamline an entire project implementation, and in turn reducing complexity, maximizing project efficiency and quality, and minimizing testing of short travels and activities. This example is uh, from a recent subsea uh, project where we started off with two parallel sub projects with no real interfaces between them. So quite simple standard projects to begin with. But as the project went on, four more sub-projects were uh, added to the portfolio. And as the cross-complexity grew, standalone offshore installation was not really an option anymore. We then saw an opportunity to utilize case by simulator to merge and integrate all the sub-projects together onshore, basically doing the whole offshore installation onshore. Then we did a stress test and moved the whole software package offshore with drastically reduced offshore efforts. As we see, uh, we, we, we saved almost 85% of planned offshore uh, hours. <clears throat> we saw an increased quality because of less, uh, less manual configuration. The stress test onshore revealed some deep dynamic issues that never would have surfaced until well startup. And the early installations in simulator enable operators to be qualified and ready when new functionality was deployed offshore. So quite an interesting case, uh, this. Uh, next slide, Gora. Uh, um, the second example is a bit more technical. So AutoShock is an autonomous application to support operators and reduce reservoir risk potentially impacting the environment. 
So the challenge here was to reduce uh, risk of rapid pressure change in a long pipeline with several wells attached. And the solution that we came up with together with, our, uh, with the customer consists of three main functions. Firstly, an automatic drawdown controller. Operator sets the required pressure rate and the choke valves auto-regulate in sync between the valves. This is quite complex. Secondly, a pressure drop controller, which is an automatic product, uh, protection against high pressure drop potentially damaging pipeline and valves. And uh, lastly, depressurization, which uh, is a linear pressure relief system and an, an, an enabler for quicker well startup. The benefits are, are safer operation, reduced operation operator load, and uh, a faster producing well after shutdown. Thank you, uh, and back to you, Claire. Thank you. And I think we just lost uh, Kåre for a little while there. Um, I'm sure he will join us again, but this is the last presentation from Kåre. And um, as is summarizing up Kongsberg Maritime's position and ambition going forward. Um, then I think we can go forward to Jason. Hey, my name is Jason McFarlane. I'll just get uh, the next slide up here. Okay. My name is Jason McFarlane. I'm a research and innovation manager in uh, Kongsberg Maritime. I've been in Kongsberg Maritime for uh, yeah, just under 14 years. So I have a, a wide cross industry uh, experience, uh, 12 of those last years being in maritime, um, but extensive experience within systems design and development, uh, as well as high level concept and strategy development. So now I have responsibility for driving innovation. Uh, this is through utilization of external funding, IP and IPR management and creative design. So what I'll talk to you today with is uh, Kongsberg control system and then also the audership project. So I've been given a task in, in talking about the Connorsberg control system to um, talk about, uh, I've been given 10 minutes to talk about 150,000 hours worth of development. So um, this is really just touching, uh, touching the, the top of the iceberg. So yeah, let's go back. So Kongsberg control system, uh, KCS, uh, we love three letter abbreviations in Kongsberg. So this is just another one. Uh, it is Kongsberg Maritime's next generation control system platform. Uh, so basically what it is, is a suite of loosely coupled software components and it provides a powerful, highly scalable, flexible and resilient foundation for Kongsberg Maritime's control system products. So to put it into con in context of where uh, the KCS system is, where does uh, KCS fit into all the other products and services and solutions we have? If you see in this illustration here, uh, there's defined standard levels within systems. Uh, at the top level, level four, you have business planning and logistics, and the physical embodiment of that is global services and remote management. <coughs> in Kongsberg, we have the offering <coughs> of a digital platform with Cognify. But then moving down to level three and two is operations management and monitoring and controlling. So this is where the KCS solutions are applicable. So this is bridge and remote control, as you can see in the illustration there. So actual, uh, the, the user interfaces and hum, human machine interfaces to operators. And it was also the business logic and presentation, which is an example here of some devices or, or hardware, which uh, the KCS system runs on. So these are standard uh, uh, PCs, but designed and built to meet uh, extreme requirements, especially in, for the offshore industry, but also maritime industry. Below that in the lower levels, so level one is where we have real-time control. Again, here there's some of our devices and modules, 
which uh, handle uh, sensor input and uh, control before sending uh, data and logic up or information up to the, the logic layer. And then in the, in the bottom, as well as uh, mentioned by Cora, we have the uh, physical processes. So this is actual uh, sensor inputs and uh, actual physical hardware such as propulsion and deck machinery. So that's where you can see where KCS and where, where the focus of my uh, presentation is. So a bit more detail, what is KCS? Uh, it's kind of when we talk about it, we have the platform itself, uh, and then we have what we call the solution configuration. Um, so as mentioned, it, the KCS platform is a suite of software components. Uh, it has a modern uh, proven architecture, and this architecture is uh, loosely coupled. So this gives us a lot of benefits, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly. It's also something which has been used, uh, not just in Kongsberg Maritime, but also used in Kongsberg Defense, another part of the Kongsberg group. In terms of the solution configuration, this is uh, virtualizes real world objects, business logic and presentation. It's actually using a very powerful uh, graph model, which I'll uh, show you soon and, uh, and talk a bit more about but it's actually a key enabling attribute for virtualization and uh, some of the aspects of industry uh, 4.0. So it binds our products together as, as solutions. So these two together, then one plus one equals a product or solution. So this is the platform plus the configuration itself. So what are the different aspects then of KCS? Uh, which make it so powerful. If we start at the top left, we have features. Uh, features are small functionality extensions, they're packages that uh, include interfaces, library, business logic and presentation. They contain everything that's needed to support the next item on the list, which is plug and play. So plug and play, a lot of you are probably familiar with, you hear it in sort of daily lives of, uh, and anyone who has a PC has probably heard of plug and play. Uh, in, in our context, it means that uh, features and the components, they need to meet a set of criteria and they have a set of goals. Uh, and these are interfaced, hosted, modeled and presented. So basically these different ones, interfaced means they need to have a, a defined interface, which is common for all features. Uh, hosted, they need to be able to be hosted within the uh, KCS system. Uh, modeled means that they, they may need to be able to set the same uh, modeling criteria so they can all be modeled in the same way. And presented, again, they need to have a common API so that uh, presentation layer components uh, and other presentation features uh, can use um, different features in the same way. So if we move on to product, the next item, then a product is basically a, a combination or composition of one or more features. So here where we have uh, specific needs or the way we're organized within Kongsberg Maritime, we have different product groups. So a product group can then set together uh, based on several different features and utilizing common features into a product specific uh, configuration and solution. In addition to that, and what pl plug and play really supports is product integration. So obviously with Kongsberg Marathon, we have a large portfolio of different products and uh, in different situations, we use a different set and different combination of, uh, of products. So product integration then building on plug and play enables different products to be integrated easily and efficiently to produce a solution that meets specific customer needs. Open interfaces. Uh, our, in KCS, it's important that we, uh, we don't only have a system that uh, enables us to integrate within Kongsberg, but there's also third party uh, suppliers or third party components and hardware that we might also need to interface with. So this is where KCS utilizes uh, open interfaces and that enables, as I mentioned, the kind of integration that we, we need in different markets. Cybersecurity, we operate with a zero trust philosophy uh, and this is with uh, identity and role-based access and it also means it's secure by design according to industry standards. Uh, it also means that the way we design these features and, and utilizing again plug and play 
it means that the, the platform itself can enable products to be cybersecurity certified. Object model, I'll hop over that one and come back to it in the next slide. But feature development, this is where not only what we produce, but how we produce and how we develop it is also a focus within KCS and part of the KCS as a program in total. So it means we have provide a development environment where it enables efficient development of products and solutions and enables us to effectively utilize all these different aspects of, of what KCS provides. So coming back to object model, which I've mentioned a couple of times now, but what is it? As you see here, this is not actually a picture from outer space. <laughs> this is a representation of uh, an object model uh, and the, the type of object model that KCS uses. So in terms, this is a, a graph and with a graph, we can imagine world in terms of, of nodes and a node might be an object or a person or a place or a thing uh, and edges which are the links between the nodes. So these are the associations or the connections uh, among them. So utilizing this type of object model, uh, it gives us the ability to model all aspects of the system under control and provide data, restrict control to external systems or allow control uh, and through standard interfaces. So it's um, a technology that enables enhanced concepts also as such as digital twins um, to model real world systems. So it actually is a, a way where we can uh, effectively model, model systems and uh, enable us to see the, the total configuration, both online in operation, but also offline as well, which gives us a huge advantage in, in many areas. So as I said, this is, uh, KCS is a very large topic. I've just sort of touched on, on briefly on the features and of what it is, um, but what does it mean and, and where do we use it? So here you can see, for example, uh, this is an example of the uh, operation center um, and it provides full situational awareness. So as I mentioned, you have the operator stations here, you have some panels. Um, these are all, or, or what KCS produces uh, are displayed in this kind of situation in this kind of environment. Um, but what it also means is with some of the features I mentioned is that the, the operation center can be both on the installation, so in Johan Swadrup, so we have this kind of control center, but it means also we can have a remote control center and we can have the same, uh, same illustrations, same uh, interfaces uh, on land as we do on the installation. So this uh, obviously gives us a much uh, broader and greater situational awareness and enables operators to see all aspects of the system you can say a little bit in the background with uh, maybe CCT Im images, but it combines all the information and all uh, everything that the operator needs to be able to operate safely and effectively. And this is also very relevant when we're talked about, we mentioned obviously with Alma Grit giving the introduction of autonomy and, and Cora also mentioning um, the levels of automated processes and autonomy. Uh, this is also an area where we see application in other areas, not just within, um, within limited applications like, uh, uh, like shown here. So where else? It gives us safety in critical operations. So as you can see here, again, uh, with process control and with the introduction uh, to Cora, you've seen this picture and, and some description of it. Um, and this with KCS it being distributed over the various platforms uh, and as I mentioned with the control center you can have same information and same level of control uh, on these different platforms and that's one of the beauty that, that KCS allows that scalability allows that flexibility and um, increases the level of safety uh, throughout. So that's where we are today with KCS. KCS is deployed, it's in operation, uh, as mentioned. Um, so this is a slightly older photo maybe of the um, of Johan Swadrup, but um, this is where we are today. But where can we use KCS in the future? It's uh, been a massive development effort, so um, it's not just a one-off. Uh, it's something that we uh, will use continually in the future in, in, in all our products and services and various solutions. So tomorrow, where will KCS be? KCS will be on uh, applications and concepts like ASCO, for example. 
KCS is one of the major building blocks that we use in uh, autonomy going forward. And that's where all of these features, which I've talked about are very important. Um, the architecture, the design in, in the sort of, in the foundation of KCS uh, enables us to horizontally scale from uh, a massive installation like Johan Sodrip with uh, thousands of uh, computers, uh, hundreds of thousands of IO points to something like a, a much simpler uh, vessel, um, yet complex in terms it will be uh, autonomous. And that's one of the benefits of KCS and it's why it's one of our, uh, one of our main building blocks going forward in the future. So just to sort of round off a bit on, on KCS um, before I go into the next part. Um, so I've talked about the technology, I've had the introduction from Anne Magritte around, around autonomy in general and where uh, Kongsberg is going. And Cora has also mentioned our, our oil and gas operations uh, and what it means there. So with all this uh, activity that Kongsberg uh, has going, um, how what, how are we realizing this? So we've shown, seen Johan Swadrup, but we've got concepts. So the next part is how do we realize this and uh, where will it be useful in the future? So to come there, I'll just tell you uh, a little story first. So why am I suddenly showing this picture? This is a summer house and in, in France, and it was my destination for a, a couple of summers ago. And the, the plan was uh, to drive myself and my family uh, from Norway down to France. Uh, we knew it was quite a, quite a long way to travel. It was going to take us three days with uh, roughly six to seven hours of driving each day. We'd picked where we we're going to be stopping along the way. So Hamburg and just north of Paris before getting to Bergerac. And uh, all was good. First day we set out, the first day went well. Um, we, we got to the destination, had some free time and uh, everything was going to plan. On the morning of day two, we checked Google Maps and then, uh, then we saw that suddenly the route we had planned had been changed. It was going to take us towards uh, in, uh, near Antwerp. And that's originally in my plan, I didn't want to do that because I knew Antwerp, the traffic was uh, not very good. But anyway, okay, an extra hour of driving, we can handle that. As we got closer to Antwerp, so came another message. There was an accident on the, uh, the ring road around Antwerp, which added another roughly hour and a half. So a seven hour drive suddenly became a more than nine hour drive. Um, and uh, along the way, this is what we saw. Massive congestion, lots of uh, cars, a lot of them were just one person in them, a lot of trucks and uh, really at a standstill for a, a, a large amount of time. But at the same time, when you looked out the window, if you could sort of not listen to the kids uh, fighting in the back and, uh, and all the noise in the car, look out the window, then uh, this is what you could see. Uh, a totally under, underutilized uh, waterway, uh, almost like a motorway of water. And, um, and this, something has to change. So you see this uh, massive congestion, a, a problem in, in several areas of Europe and anyone who's been around Belgium, Netherlands, you would have seen a similar situation. And you generally know not to get a taxi to the airport when it's, uh, when it's rush hour. But how, what's the vision? How, how do we fix this? Where do we go from here with these, uh, the problems we have that we wanna solve and, and a seemingly uh, yeah, very obvious solution in front of us? Well, that, that brought us to a vision. So the vision is this or something like this. Um, how do we utilize waterways? We have the Zulu here, which Antoon um, uh, partner in, in auto ship and um, we'll talk about soon. But with some autonomous barges, this is the vision. This is like perfect. This would solve just in this picture alone, at least 50 truckloads off the roads and ease the congestion. But what's our part in it and how do we help to reach this vision? That's where we come to auto ship. So auto ship, what is it? Um, you may or may not have heard about it, but auto ship is a Horizon 2020 funded innovation project. It responds to EU's need to increase multimodal transport and relieve road congestion by developing and integrating key enabling technologies for autonomous ships. And this is via two use cases. 
So the two use cases here is one is the uh, short sea general cargo carrier. The specific use case is a fish feed carrier called Eidsorg Pioneer, uh, which will operate off the west coast of Norway in a short sea uh, shipping route and uh, supplying fish farms with fish feed. The other one is the Inland Waterways Barge, uh, Zulu, and this will be uh, demonstrated, or both these use cases will be demonstrators, but be demonstrated in, uh, in and around the Antwerp region, the Flanders region, uh, in, a, in a selected um, route around uh, and, and near Antwerp. So this is the, the project. I'll tell you a bit more about these different use cases now. So the first one as mentioned, and uh, the autonomy levels have been mentioned. So this is a level four barge. So it is intended to, to be demonstrated unmanned. Uh, as mentioned, operating the Flanders region with a very uh, specific focus on enabling more eff effective logistics and uh, shift from roads to waterways. So shifting, uh, as mentioned, the uh, truck traffic from the roads to the waterways. Uh, in our estimations, so one barge will replace approximately 12 trucks and uh, just looking at that reduction alone, it's uh, approximately 90% reduction in emissions. Uh, this will boost utilization of inland waterways and reduce traffic congestion. So there's several very large benefits here, both for the region and for Europe in general. The second concept or use case, as mentioned, is a fish feed carrier. So this is, uh, again, we have an image of Eidsvog Pioneer here uh, with some concept uh, images of, of what might replace it uh, in the long-term future. For auto ship, this is actually level three. So there is an intention to go unmanned as uh, Anne Magritte has, has described the differentiation between autonomous and unmanned. Um, but in this one, it's the, the goals are improved safety at sea. So you're able to support uh, onboard operations from onshore. So as I showed you with the uh, Johannes Hydrup and KCS, you have a control center and uh, you can have a control center on land and the, the crew on board, they can focus on what's important. They can focus on the actual app operations out at sea, uh, but at the same time, they can get help from, uh, from uh, land. Just quickly, I see I've taken a bit long time. The, um, our partners here, uh, ourselves obviously, we have Blue Line Logistics and IDSORG, um, but we also have focus on the economic and social framework analysis uh, with Sintef and University of Strathclyde was supported by other partners within the strategic advisory group. So very briefly, just to look at the supply chain. Um, as I've mentioned, we can look at it from two aspects, going to the EU hinterland and going from the EU hinterland. Uh, and here you can illustrate, well, we illustrate how the two use cases can be connected. So we have producers and suppliers, and then we have uh, inland waterways transport to a seaport and then more transport to either destination port uh, or eventually destination being a fish farm. So what we see, especially within auto ship, is where the disruption will happen is within logistics and the business models related to the transport. Some of these things are unknown, some of the things are maybe known, but this is where these changes and what it enables uh, will, is where we think the real disruption will happen. So on a closing note, the uh, sustainable development goals. These are very important for Kongsberg and Kongsberg Maritime. Uh, specifically in auto ship, we see that it addresses these uh, five development goals uh, with the goals of the project and what we will be uh, achieving. So that ends my presentation on, on KCS and the, uh, the auto ship projects. And now I'll hand over to one of our uh, major partners uh, in the project, which is Antoon. Uh, Zulu Associates and Blue Line Logistics. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Over to you, Antoon. Hello, yes. Uh, hello, Jason. Uh, very glad to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to be here today to talk with you, uh, talk to you together with the guys from Kungsberg. Uh, my name is Antoon Van Kwali. Uh, I'm a director of Zulu Associates. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. It's very a popular term these days but anyway I started Blue Line Logistics uh, developing mainly the pallet shuttle barges which are being used to create a modal shift from the road to the waterway. 
I was, I've been active in banking, construction, real estate development, but mainly I have an interest since 2011 uh, on inland waterways and maritime elements. I did serve in the Belgian Navy, which does exist, uh, mainly wine sweeping and of course, um, fishery protection. And lastly, I have a degree of the commercial engineer at the Free University of Brussels and an MBA of uh, UCLA uh, in California. Now I need to get my uh, thing going. There we are, Zulu Associates. Um, Zulu Associates uh, has been founded on a vision. And the vision we have is that technology exists to have autonomous vessels operational in two, three years from now in short sea shipping and on inland waterways. And we also believe that using autonomous vessels will give us the economic leverage to use alternative powertrains. And that is important because we want to progress towards low and even zero emission propulsion. And this is, of course, trying to achieve the related UN SDGs by 2030 in the shipping industry. We are convinced that uh, we have to take a lot of uh, action specifically for the climate. So it's called climate action number 13 from the SDGs. There has been a lot of uh, information on that, but uh, what is to us very important is that by 2050, we need to reduce the, uh, or limit the warming of the, of the earth by, uh, to one and a half centigrade, and uh, degree centigrade. And uh, one of the main points of that is reducing the CO2 emissions. Uh, as I said, there's lots and lots of information on that. Uh, I was able to um, attend a very interesting seminar at the University of Cambridge. And again, there, this 40% by 2030, 40% reduction of CO2 is major in what we want to achieve. Shipping is also very important in that. We know that shipping contributes a large part of that CO2. And uh, specifically in the area where we live, uh, where I live, namely Belgium at the North Sea, as you can see on the chart, it's a very, very dark spot, if I may say so, with CO2 emissions. Luckily, we have the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, who has taken this to heart and uh, has set up now a timetable to reduce these emissions. Uh, and what they specifically say, and this is in line with uh, what has gone internationally, is that they want to have this reduction um, by 40% uh, by 2030. We, however, believe at uh, Blue Line Logistics that we have to go much further than that. Uh, 40%. 2030 for us is actually uh, not enough. We think they need to do more. We've also been studying and what we found is that uh, if you want to retrofit existing vessels with alternative propulsion to get to the zero emission is economically not efficient. There is competition of vessels, uh, crude vessels, uh, traditional vessels, which can go at lower prices. So it's economically difficult and it's all technically difficult. And so um, we need to do something else to get there we need to change the way we operate ships. And this is what we call a paradigm shift. Shipping needs to change to achieve the zero emission targets that we want to set ourselves. And that means we need different vessels and a different operational modi. When I talk about the paradigm shift, first of all, we talk about size. Uh, we've been accustomed to find ships growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, what we say is no, let's keep a relatively small, have small vessels versus large vessels. And the reason is that a small vessel needs less energy to move ahead and the technology to be zero emission for smaller vessel, vessels actually exist already. The second thing is that obviously you have to be autonomous and we want to have uncrewed vessels. I'll come back on the economics on that in the next slide. But uncrewed vessels, uh, have a lot of savings and if therefore if you make a vessel autonomous this is one of the ways to go ahead. The other third one is that you need to set redundancy on vessels. In other words all the systems you have have to be multiple. You can't afford to have a single system and the reason is that if a ship uh, if something breaks down you need to have something else that can take up the slack. So it's important when you design vessels that they have to have multiple systems not just one system. For example, we are designing, and I'll come to that as well, uh, a short sea vessel. It will have a bow thrust so we can, which can take over from the main propeller to bring the ship safely to a port. And lastly, <clears throat> the propulsion. An interesting point is that in many ships, the propulsion is fixed in the hull. Um, and when you want to change it, it takes uh, a lot of hassle. You have to 
take things out, you have to demolish things and new things in. We believe in having electric powered vessels with a modular powertrain that generates electricity and that powertrain can be changed as and when new technologies arrive. So you don't have to change a ship to get, uh, become more and more towards zero emission. Now, talking about the economics, because it's all very nice to play around with technology, but you need to make it work. Well, if you make autonomous vessels, you have CAPEX savings. The main savings are all the things to do with the crew. And that is mainly um, the accommodation, it's all the safety equipment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is a major cost. And opposed to that, obviously, you will have the cost of the autonomous system, but that is where we both can be brought into line. And therefore, the autonomous vessel should not cost more than a, a crewed vessel. The second main point is, of course, OPEC savings. <clears throat> and we obviously talk mainly about crew and the hospitality costs, uh, the cooks, all that sort of stuff, all the savings on the safety equipment, which you no longer use, but also insurance. Uh, the main point when you're sure a vessel, the main risk is lives. So in other words, if you have no crew, you don't have to insure for lives. Premiums will go down. And of course, uh, the other OPEC savings with autonomous vessels are, as Anne Margaret showed, savings in efficiency, using less fuel and so on. So because all of this, you create margin through using autonomous vessels <clears throat> to be more competitive than crude vessels, to have a margin for that alternative propulsion, and of course, to have a margin to go for the modular shift. <clears throat> if you look at inland waterways, what are the market opportunities we see? Well, we know that uh, based on statistics, um, vessels will need to be replaced because some of them are 44 years on average, 44 years old, using very old engines. Uh, we estimate about 2,000 new units need to be built in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, we know that the river uh, canal river capacity is available. We saw the nice picture, but uh, uh, even uh, looking at other places, this is Nijmegen in Holland or you go to Cologne on the Rhine. Uh, and this is obviously Albert Canal, which also was shown by Jason. Uh, there's lots and lots of capacity available, which is underused and the infrastructure is available. And then of course, we have the huge congestion issue. Uh, just a few uh, examples, uh, not just in uh, the Britain, but also in Antwerp on your right hand side. It is a massive problem and it continues day to day. And of course, the last one is the shortage of crews. There are not enough crews coming into the business to be able to continue. Then there are also the climate issues for inland waterways. There are low water levels due to climate change. This is a well-known fact. Uh, the Rhine often goes down. So we have these huge ships which can't sail at a full load. And obviously, which is economically is a problem. And then, of course, there's the other one, which is the reverse side of the uh, uh, flows, the, the low water levels, which is the flooding. Because we need to canal, make canals in the rivers to get the big ships go. That means that the water can flow much more freely. And that means that the moments of high water, you get flooding. And this is a picture of Cologne with the recent flooding. So these problems we need to address. By the way, I was amazed that to find that today some traditional vessel owners still install today Eurostage 2 and 3 diesel engines. You can imagine that in the next five years, these vessels will have to go out of business. So we say that for the additional advantages of small vessels, make them more interesting and therefore economically viable. They can work with the low water level conditions. They don't need large infrastructures. And last but not least, they have a much higher redundancy. If you have 10 uh, 1,000 uh, ton vessels as opposed to one 10,000 ton. If one breaks down, you still have 90% of your capacity. Oh, by the way, when you talk about large ships in canals, this is a picture of a, a large vessel uh, in Tournai, in the middle of the city. So you can imagine if that ship breaks down, everything is blocked. Short sea market. Yes, there is a market for that as well. <clears throat> We aim that uh, based on the studies from uh, the North Veritas, uh, about 5,000 vessels will have to be replaced in the next 10 to 15 years in short sea. Uh, there was a paper on that, uh, which is available and which has been published on the 15th of August, 2018. And then again, there also, there's a problem of shortage of crews. Now, 
what are the two segments we're looking at? The first one is actually going for the traditional market opportunity, uh, the traditional freight, freight segment, which uh, if you have an autonomous vessel with the same investment, lower OPEX, higher fuel efficiency, and uh, more sustainability, you create a vessel which is very much competitive with existing vessels. The second big one, of course, is the change and to go from Roro to Lolo. Uh, we've got a picture of Dover, the port of Dover, trucks waiting to get on the Roro. Roro um, has a need for major uh, ports, therefore there is a lot of congestion there. There's a lot of sustainability issues as well. Uh, that means that if you switch from Roro to Lolo with these new uh, short sea vessels, there is a price comparison, but we definitely have a lower congestion, lower emissions and far more sustainability. So what do we do with this? Well, we are developing new built vessels and we do that in uh, cooperation with Kongsberg. Kongsberg is our preferred partner in uh, achieving this. And the second thing we do is that we participate in development programs. And what do we build or are we designing to build? First of all, we're designing a new inland waterway dry bulk and container vessel called the X-Barge, which is a 1500 ton vessel. We will also make our Zulu vessels autonomous and this is a nice picture which you've seen before at Jason's presentation. And then of last but not least, we create a new short sea vessel which is being designed by BMT uh, with Kongsberg and uh, Lloyd Register as a class society. Uh, we are negotiating with, America, uh, with the uh, UK, Belgian and um, Dutch authorities to have the routes for cross-channel sailing um, for autonomous vessels. And then we participate in development programs. Uh, we've got two of them where we participate. Obviously, one is the auto ship program, which Jason talked about. And the other one is the Hell to Hell program, which is also together with Kungsberg and is mainly geared for uh, um, navigation of ships near to each other and specifically for automatic mooring. So you see, um, we believe in autonomous vessels. We think it's the future. We know it's disruptive, but for sustainable reasons, it's a must that we achieve this as soon as possible. And this is where Zulu Associate goes for, and we are extremely happy to be able to do that together with Kungsberg. So that's about all for me at the moment. I think my thing is blocked. Ah, oh, there you are, thank you. Okay. Sorry about this last thing. <laughs> no problem, um, thank you very much Antun. And now we hit the Q&A session. So um, we will start to, with some Q&As. I have received some questions here on the, on the Q&A on the live session and I have also received some on the emails. So I'll try to manage that with you guys. Um, autonomy strategy was started before the COVID-19 hit the world. And autonomy had already started its journey on the different levels of autonomy. However, what do you think, uh, how has COVID-19 impacted the way you think around autonomy and your strategy? Antun, could you um, give us an answer on this? What do you think? Um, well, COVID-19 has impacted everything we do. Um, and it has also impacted our ideas on uh, autonomy. Um, uh, it actually increases the reason to go for autonomy. Uh, the fact that when you have, have autonomous vessels, um, you don't need crew members, therefore they, you don't have the problem uh, which crew members have today to be repatriated from wherever they are. Um, it's, it's already a hard job being a seafarer. Uh, it's often when you're uh, with a small group of people uh, rather in confined places. So psychologically, socially, it's not an easy job apart from the physical, the pure physical thing. So it's good to be able to every now and then go back home and things like that. Today, this is very difficult, even say impossible. So for the, for the, for the benefit of the seafarers to go for autonomous vessels is a major point. Uh, very positive. Another one, an interesting one, is uh, if you look at the uh, cross-channel uh, traffics we're looking at, going from uh, Europe continent to Britain, for example, uh, 
the COVID-19 limits the use of truck drivers. It's, it's becoming more and more difficult. Therefore, the switch to Lolo from Lolo is becoming uh, more acute. And again, that's if you want to be uh, uh, competitive with Lolo, the only way to go is by autonomous vessels. So yes, COVID-19 is a, uh, a prime vector uh, for uh, accelerating the look and the work for autonomous vessels. Thank you, Antoon. As we move up to the levels of autonomy, the humans will be in, involved differently for the different levels. So, but how do you see the role of the humans for autonomy on Margaret? Thank you, Astrid. I think that is one of the key questions because when we're talking about the levels from level two operator support, remote control, uh, even for continuously unmanned operations, there are still people in the loop, both in designing the systems and solution, as well as monitoring and keeping an eye on everything going on board. So there is still a high level of human interaction. And also, as we touched upon that uh, smartness and the understanding and knowledge of the Naval uh, Marine Affairs is necessary to design the systems to operate in a, in a correct behavior. So we will need that human in that loop all the way through until at least we somewhere in the future might reach a level five where the operation is fully autonomous independent of uh, human interaction well it's good to hear that to, we are we are still needed i think how do you think about that in oil and gas producing assets uh, Gauta? what is the role of the humans in an autonomous world I think uh, I totally agree about the uh, first answer here. And uh, first of all, I think uh, humans and especially experts working in the oil and gas domain will play a vital role designing and testing the control system for the future. Uh, and also the development will not stop even when we can control the core, core controls in level five and uh, autonomy. Um, and uh, also I think we have a lot of work in front of us so I'm not especially worried about the, the future. Thank you. But what about safety then? Safety is a lot of times mentioned as a critical factor for autonomy, especially when we move up these levels. What if connectivity is missed? And uh, the other question also goes, can autonomy increase safety on Magritte? I think that is a really interesting uh, discussion, Astri, and, uh, and one also where we talk with different partners and we are not seeing eye to eye on every aspect of this because you might think that the natural step would be to have remote control of a vessel rather than having it perform its own logic and be more available and um, have the possibility to operate by itself. But on the other hand, that renders the connectivity solution to a really safety critical system. And I think the IMO has actually opened their eyes towards this as well. So is it really safer to have your hand on the gear, to put it like that, from a remote um, location sitting and directly controlling a vessel rather than having it perform its pre-programmed tasks with a fallback strategy already implemented. And I think another interesting aspect worth mentioning is actually how the insurance companies are looking towards this. They are actually willing to lower the premiums for more automation and uh, autonomous vessels. So they are chairing on this, they are pushing towards solutions which require higher levels of automation, realizing that still a too large number of uh, casualties in the maritime operations are caused by human errors. Mm. Thank you, uh, Anne Margaret. We have a question here about business logic. I think this goes to you, Jason. Um, when you were talking about business logic as being integrated in the automation, what exactly is meant by that term? Yeah, in, uh, in general, we refer to it as the, the sort of commonly accepted uh, definition of business logic in, in programming. So it's more just sort of the, uh, not necessarily the business operating rules, but it's more sort of uh, rules related to the control system. 
Uh, so this is um, this is what we mean when we refer to, to business logic. So it's more a reference to sort of the commonly accepted uh, term within within programming. So rules, but not specifically business operating rules, but more uh, rules related to the control system and and operation and presenting data, for example, collected from uh, other levels within the uh, the control system. Another question here goes to Antun. What do you believe are the regulatory obstacles to commercializing inland waterways autonomous vessel operations? Um, well, first of all, we are in luck in Flanders, Belgium, and uh, also in Holland, that today we can already uh, operate autonomous vessels, not on a fully free basis, but uh, enough that it's actually almost uh, possible um, on, auto, uh, on a how they call it, a regulatory way. The laws and regulations have not changed, but we can get exceptions. This is obviously paving the way uh, towards a full uh, possibility and full regulation adaptation. Now, uh, things are being done at the moment, uh, not only in Flanders, because the Flemish waterways are part of the authorship program and part of the regulations review is part of that authorship program. But they are working very hard with the CCNR and also UNIC are working very much on the need for uh, adapting the regulations, allowing autonomous vessels. Now on inland waterways, uh, I think especially in uh, Belgium and in the, and in the Holland, uh, I can see this within the next two years to be totally commercially viable. Uh, if that is the case, then the north of France will follow easily. Uh, we have uh, Germany, uh, which is next door. Uh, the Rhine is a definite possibility. So they are also gearing up slowly. Um, and there are some other op opportunities as well around in Europe. So yes, there are uh, a number of things that need to be uh, uh, taken, a number of um, changes that need to happen, but the authorities are working on it because they know for sustainability and also for economical reasons that needs to be done. So yeah, within the next two years, we'll have that. Can I just add uh, also to, to Antoine's answer is, um, as mentioned with the Autoship project, the, the focus is not just on the, the technical deliveries and the demonstrators themselves, but issues such as regulations, uh, what sort of rules and how do we achieve commercialization of autonomous shipping uh, within five years of the project start. So there's heavy focus on that in addition to focus on societal impact uh, infrastructure, what, what other needs need to be in place. So it's uh, auto ship is, is much more than just the technical demonstrators it actually covers uh, what is needed within Europe to achieve autonomous shipping commercially within uh, five years from, from last year, so 2024. And I would also like to add that uh, for cross-channel vessels, uh, there are, we are now negotiating with, as I said, the UK, Belgian and Dutch authorities to obtain the necessary approvals to move uh, within in certain routes to uh, autonomously cross a channel. So this is, this is happening at the moment. This is not something for the long, long future. To build upon that, we have another question here that is very much related to regulations here from Jose, I'm wondering about the environmental impact of shifting traffic to inland waterways in terms of water pollution, fish and plants, because we mentioned that we have a reduction of emissions. Um, um, I suppose that's for me as well. Yes. It's an interesting one. Uh, and again, if uh, we have smaller vessels, uh, you don't need to disturb the waterways to get these vessels go through. So you don't need to dredge, you don't need to make uh, deep uh, canals within the rivers to do that. So your natural environment is much less, uh, what I say, uh, changed uh, when you use smaller vessels. Uh, if we have vessels that are uh, fully electric, uh, on short distances today, we could even use uh, hydrogen uh, powered uh, diesels or even the fuel cells. If you go from Antwerp to Brussels, that distance today can already be sailed with a fully electric vessel, which basically has no pollution on the water. Again, another big advantage is you don't have crew, and so you don't have any waste that goes into the river from the crew, which uh, used to happen, although it's forbidden, but it still used to happen. So uh, I would say it would improve tremendously uh, the waterways um, by having small vessels electrically powered, and of course they need to be autonomous to do that. Mm. 
Here comes another question around uh, operators or the new control centers. So what are the most significant challenges of finding operators for the new control centers? So kind of removing people from uh, the ship or the platform to a remote operating center. So what are the most significant challenges in doing that? I think the question can go to Anna Grit. Thank you, Astrid. And also, get to have some comments on this, but I can go first. I think um, we have seen some examples previously, um, both on board vessels where engine rooms have become unmanned, for example, and you see that shift and people are um, tending to be a little hesitant to do those kind of shifts, but ultimately there is no way back. So you are going that direction. Another example is from uh, drones, for example, not too many years back. Um, the first thought was that a pilot, uh, um, a plane pilot would be the best operator of a drone. But then as you gradually learn more and more about that operation, you see that that doesn't necessarily need to translate because you need different skill sets. So that is actually the discussion we're having right now with the universities of masters and mariners to see what type of education, what type of persons, and also to distinguish between the Haba Maba principle, meaning what humans are best at and what machines are best at. Because you can also imagine that just looking at something and monitoring it for, for extensive periods of time time and then suddenly alarms go off and you are expected to be on the ball on the moment and know exactly what to do is not an ideal setting for a human operator um, as such. So this is really um, an interesting aspect. We don't have the full answers to this yet as it's in the stage of research and development, um, but this is where we at least are engaging heavily with operators, with people who have that type of experience to, to understand more and also how to have more efficient work days because there are so many manual processes today that you can actually automate as well. So it's not just about the, the, the live operation, it's all about the ship administration as well. Thank you. But what about in the offshore uh, oil and gas production assets where we have new control centers and uh, we're not so reliant on the offshore worker anymore. And uh, wh what are the challenges there, Gette? <clears throat> I, I still think that it will be a need for kind of the core understanding of the operation still. So we see, see a lot of uh, data scientists coming into the, to the operational space now, but uh, we, we have to revert back to understand the actual core uh, business of what we're doing and uh, as I mentioned in the last question um, it's just fundamental to understand the process to be able to automate it as well and also I think um, um, autonomy will be a huge enabler to ensure an even safer and more sustainable operation um, as we will get the more exact understanding of the interfaces and the weaknesses of the actual operation that we we, we do so um, one of the aspects is to actually optimize the, uh, the operations further, and I think uh, there's definitely a space for, for oil and gas experts in that area. Well, thank you. I'm sure there's a lot of good uh, work that needs to be done to integrate the, the operational people and the IT people to make this happen going forward. Can I just add as well, Astrid, that, um, and this is, uh, as uh, both Gautam and Amagita mentioned, this is an area where um, there is uh, some research being done and, and Kongsberg is in, involved in in several different research projects to, to look at exactly this challenge as the, the operator in a, in a control centre environment and what it means, what aspects need to be taken consideration of. So um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, interesting area to, to work on as well. Thank you for popping in, Jason, and uh, please continue to do that um, when we do these questions. Another question here uh, is, how will unload and offload of containers and trucks be handled when you have an automated vessel? I think I will need to, to place that due to you, Antun. Well, um... What will happen is that, I think, I mean, that's what we're working at, is that um, you will have certain berths where these vessels come. 
they will birth themselves, uh, whether magnetically or some other systems. And of course, you can organize that birth then to start loading and unloading uh, the vessel. Uh, if it's a container vessel, uh, this is already happening today, more or less, uh, in certain ports. Uh, the uh, actual loading and unloading already happens uh, automated. Uh, in Rotterdam, they even move the containers uh, with uh, automated trucks already. So uh, that's one thing. Of course, if you talk about brake bulk and so on, but again, if a ship is moored, then people can go on board and they can start uh, getting the brake bulk out. Uh, as for bulk, well, same system. Um, for inland waterways, uh, we're looking also at when the ship arrives at a certain place, some people will be uh, organized so that they know they, how to operate the lifting equipments, etc., and load and unload the vessel. So in the future, it can be fully automated, but in the meantime, it can still be done by humans. Mm. This also, oops, it's another question. Um, what is your reference for stating that the additional cost of redundant systems or technologies for autonomous vessels outweighs the cost of crew? I think this also goes to you, Antoine. Uh, well, there are two elements. Uh, what does it cost to put people on a ship, i.e. the accommodation? How much does a loo cost? Uh, even the simple um, equipment, uh, you know, all the safety equipment, all that sort of stuff is, is a huge budget. Um, we've done calculations and we find that uh, the budget that gives us uh, for doing this is uh, large enough to be able to pay for the autonomy. On the OPEC side, um, we obviously don't have any crew on board, but you will have certain people that will work in the ports. And of course, you have the remote control center costs. Uh, again, uh, looking at the costs, operational costs for short sea and for um, inland waterways, uh, you know, uh, having a 24 hour operation on an inland ship with uh, four or six people, you can easily calculate what the cost of that is. And if uh, opposed to that, you have a remote control center where you have uh, more than one ship to the operator and you have a number of people uh, that will um, uh, receive the vessel or put the vessel on its way, you will find that there's a difference which is enough to be able to do so. Mm. I think to our old jump in saying you said I, I could do Astrid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are free to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> the um, what we also see is that uh, because obviously with autonomy, like Anne Margaret has shown, and and what we're looking at auto ship, it's it's not just the technology or the vessel. So so any of these calculations, we often talk about. Uh, obviously, it's capex, and and we focus on operating a single vessel, um, but where the larger benefits on, on a, in a bigger picture is when you, like I mentioned a bit, where you disrupt business models or, or existing logistics um, and where the benefits are also outside, not just the operating costs of the vessel itself, um, but what other benefits do you get? Do you get more uh, with a smaller vessel that operates maybe 24-7? Uh, you can have more frequent delivery, for example. So um, maybe you don't, uh, a customer doesn't need as much storage. Um, they can get goods when they need them. Um, you support a, a totally different way of transporting uh, goods in, in a total sort of mobility picture. Um, so even though it, it's obviously very important and we do focus on concrete sort of benefits and, and capex measurements and, and crew costs, um, there is a bigger picture, which we also include in some of our calculations, but it's a bigger picture. Some of it's known, some it's unknown, but um, there's definitely a disruption on the way once we get a more sort of autonomous mobile uh, system in place uh, in, in various segments and areas. Yeah, this comes now, I think, and we need to go to the last question as we uh, are very soon hitting our deadline here. But there's a lot of questions around humans and related to autonomy. And one of them is also the impact on human manpower, according to automation. So when we to climb the ladder up, uh, we've talked about sustainability here, but removing costs and, and so on. The sustainability is obviously also about manpower and re removing uh, removal of poverty. So, how do you see the life of the humans in this world, Jason? 
Yeah, no, that's um, a, a good question and something which is uh, is raised often, especially around autonomy when we, we talk about and uh, you know, the, and it's one of the reasons why I differentiate between unmanned and manned. Um, but in addition to the focus that we have with with safer jobs is is one element, um, but also with uh, the, the shift to shore based jobs, um, because if we look at say autonomy level four and below, there will always be uh, a person uh, what we call a human in the loop. So there'll be a person involved in the system uh, via a con shore control center, for example. So the shift there will be that instead of people, and especially in inland waterways, younger people don't want these jobs uh, or aren't taking them, uh, that you will actually change from being an operator to on a barge to being an operator in a control center, which will be more like an office job. It will be nine to five. You don't have to work shift away from family, away from friends. Um, so that, in that respect, that's where we see there's a, there's a benefit um, in addition to the general value creation, which we've been discussed quite a bit about moving, having jobs in Norway and, uh, and having development done in, uh, in the EU, not Norway, Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that was a good closure, Mark. Uh, humans are still in the loop and... Uh, Thank you very much for joining this event and uh, see you soon.